mom bought me this hat, which I love, right? Has a little thingy balls on top. Boop, boop, boop. And my hair isn't done, so I'm just like, shit, fuck it. I'm going to wear my hat. Hey you guys, welcome, welcome. We're getting ready to get started. Hi Yola, Mr. Bishop is on. Cleveland Bourbon Girls here. Hello. Thank you for joining me for another Steady Mixing with your girl, Miss Champagne B, on the ones and twos today. Hello, how y'all doing? Been a little under the weather, but I'm back, baby. I'm back with a vengeance in my thingy ears. <clears throat> Uh, thank you for joining me today. Um, today, so last week we were really cool. We had Mr. Mixologist uh, Josh on the, on the mic. He came over here, blessed with some information. And that was awesome about how to get into the uh, bartending business. Now we're about to travel to the motherland, over the seas, over the oceans, to Africa. And speak to Mr. Rum Bishop, who's eagerly excited to be on his live today. And I'm just as eagerly excited that he's about to join so let's let's get him on here real quick <clears throat> sorry guys Let's see oh i just excited ex ex uh, inviting you bro what's going on let's see let's see Hello. hey good how's morning it going? uh good just woke up let's I do know. this with you again. it's like 5 a.m yeah. over there isn't it it's 5 a.m First of all, thank you so much. I shall not keep you long because I know you need to sleep. I, I, I wake up early, so you don't have to worry. There's a lot that, yeah, that I get to do, so it's fine. What time do you normally, wait, what time do you wake up normally? 4.30. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, what time do you, well, so, so, well, first of all, I have so many questions, okay? So many questions. Welcome, Michael. is it pronounced Rum Bishop? Yeah, Rum Bishop, yeah. How did right. you come up with that username? What's that about? It's all about rum. Right. I love rum. Rum is it's the biggest thing across the world, I guess. It's um it's the one thing that defines Africa in the sense that there's a whole lot to do with the sugar industry that is a mess in uh -huh. every aspect. Uh -huh. So if you want to stay in the sugar industry, you better make rum. You know, you, you better start with the one thing that is easy to make. So it's rum. So um and it became something that I was passionate about because my grandma, I grew up in a culture where sugarcane was a lot of, um, it was there, prevalent. So it made a lot of sense that uh, we could make rum out of sugarcane. And part of that has been the mission that I've been trying to get people to actually know and identify. If you want to help Africa grow in terms of the spirits industry, let's make what we're familiar with, which is rum. Mm -hmm. So, but, and the fact that rum is delicious, Rum is good with everything that we eat, whether it's chicken, beef, whatever it is. We just, you know, put anything on the table. So long as there's rum, there's always a smile. So I mean, so we're gonna go into that because I again, so many questions. But first, like, yeah. do what do you want me to call you rum, or is there another name I can call you? Or what would what what would you like everyone to know your name as? Oh, my name, my original name is Eugene. Eugene, nice to meet you, Eugene. I'm yeah. Champagne. Welcome. Thank you for joining us last week. Got you here this week. You're and you're a yeah, bartender yeah. in Africa, right? What part of Africa? Yeah, Kenya, East Africa. Kenya, East Africa. So, yeah. what 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 got you into the bartending scene? It, I got into the bartending scene by accident. A friend of mine made me a daiquiri. Very funny story. Mm -hmm. I was a chef back then, so he made me a daiquiri, and I was like, "What is this?" thing that you're making. I mean, it's lime, sugar, and something. You know, I was like, I'd grown up with it, but I never really thought about it as a cocktail thing. And uh, when he made it, I was like, okay, this is really good. So it kind of made me frustrated that all my life had been exposed to this particular side of things, but I never really saw it as a cocktail. Mm -hmm. So for the, for the past um, two years, after he introduced me to this daiquiri, I was like, Maybe there's something more to it than just what I had known before. So I got into the industry and I was like, okay, there's cognac, there's, there's wine, there's all this. Because as a chef, you always are taught about food and wine pairing. But it made me actually want to learn more about spirits and know how to pair spirits with food. 
And so rum became the first thing that I genuinely loved. I mean, I tried vodka and was like, nah, mm. this is like not my thing, you know? Like, so like everyone else, you try different spirits and you're like, then you finally find the one that makes you home. Yes. So, you know, so I, I tried all this uh, gin, vodka and all this. And I finally like, decided I'm not going to compete with my heart. My heart is stuck to this sugar cane based spirit. And it became a mission for me to educate people and expose them to what rum is. And after all, rum is not just something that is a sweet li- liqueur on the bar because that is the biggest misconception we have even in, within the industry. So I felt like people needed to know more about it because we already have people who are doing whiskey, we have already people doing um, gin, but we don't have people who solid. I mean, who understand rum the way I would want them to understand. So that became something that. I felt the continent needed. All right. So when you, um, yeah. how long have you been, how long have you been bartending? Um, this is my 15th year. 15 Give years? 15 years. I've been, I've been doing this for a very long time. It's just, um, it's quite strange, you know, yeah. well, being a bartender, being a chef, being a farmer, um, being a, farmer? a consultant. Yeah, I'm a farmer. Okay. Don't you know? Do you see like what I'm growing on my timeline? No, I didn't see what you wrote. I just went through. So what I went through is I went through your uh, your Instagram and I looked at all your cocktails. Yeah. I looked at some of your. Um, I saw that you did some collaborations with people in a a young lady in Mexico. I saw that you did yeah. collaboration with. Uh, I don't know where this guy was from. I can't call his name, but I saw that you did different collaborations with different bartenders who are from different parts of the the world um, yeah i mean how, how did you link up with these people uh i mean this industry is kind of very interesting because we are we're a very small neat family with everyone from across the world doing the same thing but with mm-hmm. different experience and so for me i always felt the challenge of let's network and especially during the covid period i felt like most of us were at home and there's nothing much you can do so it doesn't take common sense to hit each other up and check on each other and in the process we actually begin this conversation of what can we do even within the spaces we are in and how can we change so and i felt like especially for africa we hear about these bartenders brand ambassadors but we never really get to have a conversation with them so for me it was like i needed my fellow African community bartenders and baristas to understand it is actually possible to reach them out. Let them know how we feel and let them understand how this market is. And I think that for me was a, was a, was a breakthrough because I had known some of these people from everything that I had done. And I felt like it is now time to bring that bridge closer. Mm-hmm. Let's not make Africa sound like this foreign place that is just somewhere across the world, you know, because everyone knows Africa for one thing or the other, but do they do they really understand there's more to Africa than just safari? You know, for example. I agree. One of the things I was uh, I was telling my friend is that we really don't have a lot of exposure to different cultures, depending at least here in the states, unless you go seek it. And you yeah. know, when I was growing up, Africa was just painted in such a a derogatory light, like the cartoons we watched when I was a kid and the kind of things we say. So when you thought about Africa, if you're like, I'm not going to visit Africa. And it wasn't until I went to Puerto Rico that I saw this yeah. commercial and it was like the beautiful water and the land and the nightlight. And I'm like, ooh, where is that? I don't need to go there. And then at the end, it was like, come to Africa. And I was like, what? That's Africa? Yeah. So it's you know it was crazy that I had to leave the United States mainstream industry, the mainstream uh, propaganda and media, until I saw Africa in a different life. And, and another thing that people fail to recognize is Africa is not a country; it's a continent. Like they say, it's a continent, but they don't. Understand yeah, it's a continent of fifty-four countries. You know, yeah, it's so you can't different countries. So you can't really say that you've come to Africa and like which part of Africa, you know, you need to actually know because every part of Africa has different cultures, different setups, different experiences, even in terms of the cocktail culture, you know? So like if, um, if you go to West Africa, you'll find that they love bitter stuff, you know, stuff like Campari. It's a big thing that because they believe that Campari is a natural 
Viagra, you know, like oh. so they use it more <laughs> in drinks. So it's like it's a manly stuff, you know. It's what gets the the crowd going. But then if you go down to South Africa, it's a whole lot because like South Africa has a has a lot of gin production happening, a bit of rum production in happening. So the crafts in there it's pretty much intense. And then when you come to East Africa, you also seen a lot of cocktail revolution, and it's been spearheaded by Kenya, whereby. If you cannot make it in Kenya, you cannot make it in Tanzania or Rwanda or Uganda because Kenya is like the benchmark of East Africa, even in terms of how you set up your businesses, how you run up your things, because we like the most toughest consumers to please. Like if you break through Kenya, it's like, well, that's a lot. Because we just tell you as it is, if your cocktails are not meeting the expectations, we're like, ah, nah, you you ain't going to do that, right? (laughs) So have you ever have you ever traveled to other countries outside of Kenya? Well, outside the continent of Africa, have you traveled like to the United States or any other place? Yeah, I have been fortunate to travel. Mm-hmm. Where, where have you gone? I mean, I've been to the US. My sister is actually in the US, which is she's studying computer science. She's doing her masters. Mm-hmm. I've been to London. I've been to Asia as well. So it's been really an interesting scope. But as I say, I may travel to all these places and, but in the end of the day, Africa is home. Africa is a motherland. You know? right. We need to work on here. There's a lot of work. There's a lot of potential. There's a lot of in, um, investment opportunity in Africa. I just feel like, especially for the black market, the American black market, y'all are missing out if you're not stepping into Africa because one of the key things that happens is that people who step into Africa and they visit and they experience, you definitely do not want to leave Africa. And that's what I was even telling Josh the other day. Like, you're so lucky you're not even leaving America because the day you leave, you ain't coming back. Mm -hmm. You'll just, you'll be here. So forget. So be sure if you're coming, just come ready to, to stay. I had a, a friend of mine, she said she traveled to, I think, Ghana, and they made her a sidecar cocktail, and she was like, it's one of the best that she ever had just because of the t- Well, one, she was like, it took like a long time, and she was like, I was wondering where they're going out to grow the products, but just the fact that you guys use so much natural products there, and it's at your hands, it just made it so much better. By you traveling to these different places, what are some of the things you notice? Um, the differences you notice between the African cocktail industry versus other places that you have gone? I mean, the Af- so number one, the African cocktail industry is way much slower, but way much more progressive. What do I mean? We tend to sort out our ingredients locally from with the local farmers. We have things that most people are not fortunate to have. You know, for example, Cocoa grows very well in Ghana. So you find that cocoa is used a lot in most of their cocktails. Why? Because it's a natural fruit grain, you know, so they don't have to struggle. I mean, coffee grows in Kenya, which means I don't have to use, you know, grade C coffee. Right. I mean, I get used to very, So that, that kind of exposes and that kind of determines how the cocktail culture grows here because most of us depend solely on the ingredients that we have around, you know. Mm-hmm. And the consumer preference, you know. So it's more easy access the the cocktail. It's more, yeah, it's more easy access, but it also gives a challenge because you have to constantly experiment, constantly work around the seasonality of the different fruits. Right. Okay. Did you um when you're what what about the the interaction with other bartenders? I know here in the United States, uh, one of the things is as black bartenders we do. I won't say words like complain, but one of the issues that we do have is trying to break into that mainstream Im- imagery, or industry. Sorry, but with Africa, everybody looks like you. So how's that camaraderie, that interaction with other bartenders? Is do you feel like you have that uh, that one person who's trying to stop you from from moving forward, from excelling? Is it just like, hey, we're all one big family, let's make it happen? Like, how would you say that interaction is with your fellow bartenders in Africa or in Kenya? Well, I mean, what's 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 interesting is that um, the brands, most of the brands that are in the market, kind of determine how people look at each other or how kind of people uh, view each other in terms of even how you're doing in the industry. So, like for me, I tend to work a lot with very small brands. I, I stopped working with big brands because I felt like everybody knows, you know, what like 
Johnny Walker is or what Bacardi is, but people don't know about the small industries. And then I felt like we needed to actually take a different approach because number one, if you live, if you live Africa, very few people know what African products are there, you know, and I'm a big fan of using African producers because if you're going to be in a continent like this, you, you better start using African products as much as possible. Try to push and educate people that Africa is not just this market that takes European or American products only. They actually have their own stuff there they can use, you know. And sometimes the stuff that we were producing here in terms of spirits, really good. Mm-hmm. Better than most of the stuff I've tasted across the world, you know. Now, I know with the bigger brands, they already have that exposure. And with smaller brands, the benefit that you're giving to that smaller brand is that you're giving them exposure. What do you feel yeah. benefits you by working with a smaller brand? <clears throat> the growth. And growing, with them, growing with them is the best experience you can ever get. Mm-hmm. Seeing these brands grow, uh, get, bringing them to market, seeing people actually appreciate what smaller brands can offer because even in the midst of all these big brands, smaller brands offer what we call, I mean, the heart of the producer. Because you better, like when you think about it, even from a point of gene, gene is this spirit that we all love, we all enjoy. But if you were to ever think of how many farmers you need to actually make a gene, that is a lot. So, and especially in Africa where but people assume, oh yeah, you know, you can just make, oh, I mean, you can grow all these things. It's not necessarily grown in the same place. So you can have a gene producer in closer to the city, but all his ingredients are being sourced from one corner to the next corner of the country. So it's something that now people need to understand. I mean, here it is more or less like you actually have to really source all ingredients from different corners of the country or different corners of the continent to actually make one product. And that's the beauty of working with small producers. It puts your price checks in terms of even understanding how to price your cocktail, how to value the experience from a different perspective, other than working with a big brand. But you just know this thing, regardless of what I do, it's available in the supermarket or it's available in the mall, you know? Smaller brands, you're never really going to find them everywhere. you got to have to look at one specific supplier or distributor because they have taken time to actually go through this thing whereby it's, it's in detail, you know? Mm-hmm. So I want to circle back to rum. So you were talking about rum and um, from, so I have a lot of friends who are from Africa, from all different countries. And, you know, they tend to drink our brands of, of vodka, but they also do something called roots. And I don't know, do you have that in Kenya where you have the, the different type of roots and it's like wood, it looks like there's woods and there's yeah. different type of herbs and they pour the liquor in it. Yeah. Like it. Funny, enough, funny enough, my grandma, who's a traditional doctor, mm-hmm. I grew up taking something that looks, that looks like a cocoa, bitter cocoa. I mean, it was water. It was pretty intense, <laughs> pretty, pretty intense. She used to pick all these herbs, roots, and all these things, and then she'll boil the life out of them, and she'll wake up every morning, and she'll give you a big mug, and she'll tell you, drink this, it's really good for your health. Mm-hmm. So growing up, I did not like that at all. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is just, ah. Uh. Now, funny enough, you get exposed to Campari, you get exposed to all this Vermont, and you're like, I am actually very familiar to this. Mm-hmm. Because either with bitterness level, is on the same level or slightly lower. So now what happens is now that um, after tasting all this apparatus mm-hmm. and all this, then I go back to my grandma and I tell my grandma, do you realize what you're doing is what the Western market is doing, but in a distilled format? And she's like, what are you talking about? Then she tastes, I give her a comparative taste and she actually compares me and she's like, Clearly, I'm better at doing this, you know, even, <laughs> even though I, even though we are boiling the life out of this stuff. So it's kind of interesting because it actually made me love Campari because I'm I'm a big lover of bitter experience or bitter drinks. I'm like one of those people who enters a restaurant or a bar and I'll have to order like a Campari and a Martini Rosso over Tony Quarter mm-hmm. just before I eat. You know? So it's something that I'm very familiar with. Yeah. And- Say that because you keep saying bitters. 
And I'm reminded to them when they would say, I'll take the bitters. And I'm like, well, what, what are you talking about bitters? And they're like, the roots. I'm like, oh, so they're calling the yeah. roots bitters. So is bitters like, is bitters the name, the name that like a, a generic name for all kinds of alcohol? Or if it's bitters that you know they're specifically talking about something like Campari? I mean, bitters, when you're talking about like all this hub, hub uh, stuff, you know, the stuff that is really, really bitter that you can't just take on, unless you have like this acquired palette of the bitterness of the roots, the herbs and the tinctures, which also explains a lot because during the COVID period, I, when I started doing my farm projects, I went back and asked my grandma to give me some of the roots and uh, herbs and the trees that she was growing, she grew up knowing so that I could actually start to grow them and make my own. So I have now begun this whole process whereby I am appreciating all these um, different textures, different bitterness from these traditional roots and traditional plants, which initially was something I used to hate. But now growing old, you kind of feel like you owe it to her to love these plants because it's like passing down knowledge. You, At one point, you don't like it. Mm-hmm. And another point, it's a rite of passage, more or less. Right, Because you can't run away from what um, you grew up, even if you want to. And what's your what's your drinking age? Let's see, what's the the youngest legal limit for you to drink alcohol is in in Kenya? Because I don't want to say Africa, because I'm sure it can vary. But in Kenya, <laughs> what's the legal drinking? Uh, eighteen. You gotta be eighteen. The youngest. Okay. Yeah, you have to be eighteen. What? But people. But people in, like, let me just say, people in campus, people in high school, kind of sneak it out. Like, it depends on how you've grown, and it also depends on the culture around it. Because there's a whole lot to do with culture, background, and experiences, you know, and also depending on your um, economic um, economic power, you are exposed to different things. You know, like, if you live um, what I call below the means of, normal living rate, you'll find people are pretty di- predisposed to w- what we have, like the cheap liquor, like just the ones that you take like this and you wake up the next morning with an entire migraine. Like, mm-hmm. it will knock the folks off. Mm. The kind of thing that you, say, y- you better eat a lot because mm. this is not your, you don't know where it comes from. Just better eat. Prepare your stomach because you never know what happens. All right. I think you could, we could safely say that's that's here in the states too. If you ain't got a lot to going for yourself, you might be drinking a lot of liquor to help you get through the day. Uh, so you told me you got up at four thirty for a lot of, uh, and I won't say uh, all my bartender friends, but um, like so when I, we bartend sometimes here, as most often maybe at night, you do have people who work in a restaurant. Do you work in a restaurant, a resort, in a bar? Like where where do you currently bartend? I am now a farmer. Now I'm a farmer. Right. I grow food. You just bartend. You now you're doing it for the the love of it, but now you focus on farming. Yeah, now I focus on farming. A lot of food farming, hub, uh, hub farming, hub farming. Um, all the spices and stuff like that. I'm also trying to open up the market to understand the other side of cocktails, which is cocktail development, how to develop menus and all that, and that is based out of what is grown on the farm. So like this um entire is it this entire period we've mm-hmm. been having a lot of pomegranates so i have been fortunate enough to do a pomo a spicy pomegranate um syrup that i just uh worked Ooh. on from the farm so it, it's given me the opportunity to create things that i will not normally create if i was working for someone you know i mean that kind of also exposes the market to understand things are bound to change out of seasonality so with the pomegranate so i have a syrup that is basically pomegranate hibiscus ginger uh, oregano lemon thyme um yeah wow which i'm now using for most of the cocktails that i'm doing for this period and then of course after this season of course there's gonna be another fruit that's gonna be in season and um you know so i get to play around with all that I love pomegranates. That would that is gonna be fire. I might have to I never thought about doing spicy pomegranate. I'm not gonna rip you off, but I, I definitely probably will play with that a little bit over here. I don't think we have some of the same herbs that you may have, but I think that is an interesting so we'll have we'll have to have a cocktail off. You do your spicy pomegranate cocktail versus my spicy 
pomegranate. Yeah. Back to health. And so, and so the, the, the weird thing that people don't seem to understand, the um, culinary side and the cocktail side of things should, should basically like mesh up together. Mm-hmm. So uh, because I was a chef, I used to understand um, how to work with different flavors. So every time I create a puree or a syrup, my my first process is what works well with this underlying fruit. So if it's a fruit, for example, like passion, passion works well with black tea. It works well with lemongrass, lemon verbena, a bit of black pepper. So I basically use that as an underline of creating something that is consistently herbal, spicy, mm-hmm. and very fruity so that you get all these experiences such that even if you're not drinking, you can actually make a cocktail that is balanced for someone who doesn't drink you know so that they don't feel like they are missing out on any, on anything else that's pretty cool so let's let's talk about rum um yeah uh so you know i'm familiar with rum being very prominent in the caribbean areas i've yeah. never thought of rum being a major staple in african or even you know african culture so like what's what's the background behind that how did rum become that drink for i'll, I'll say kenya and africa so rum has essentially been underestimated you know because when you think about it uh from the village perspective where there's a with where there's sugarcane there's a lot of traditional distillation happening but we don't call it rum we call it we have different names you know like we have uh, here uh in western kenya it's called changa you know where it's made purely it's like it's just the same thing as chlorine in Haiti or whatever and um and depending on the different regions how it's produced or what is added into it makes it a whole entire different and so it's only until recently that um probably four or five years ago that we started to have people actually wanting to invest in the spirits market. So the two spirits that are being produced in Africa is gin, mm-hmm. well, number one, because gin is, we are blessed enough to have enough of these botanicals across Africa. And number two, rum. Rum became because as a result of the sugarcane industry. Um, everyone was like, uh, there's a lot of mess in this, within the industry, but at least for the sake of maintaining the farmers to grow sugarcane, let's produce this beautiful spirit. So you have countries that are actually working to not locally, like not nationally produce rum, but we have investors in different countries who are actually working on producing rum, which is beautiful because they are producing rum the way they see it fit. You know, if you go to Liberia, there's rum sanaga, which is an agricultural style of a rum. If you go to... Uh, Nigeria, they have something we call palm wine. Um, when it's distilled, it doesn't taste like what you classify as a rum because it has it has like this weird experience. It has notes of mezcal. At the same time, it has a freshness of an agricultural rum. It's just this weird thing that just tastes really good. And so with Africa, you get to experience a lot of this individuality based on the local production scene, you know, which is something that I've told people. That's why you cannot put Africa in a container and just say, this is what Africa looks like. Because even the style of rum or even the style of production of gin or even the style of production of any local spirit is so ingrained to that particular locale that determines what the outcome is. Wow. So do you, in the rum in Kenya, what are the, what's the basis for is it? Does it, does it start off with being the sugar cane that's fermented or what are the ingredients or the, what's the rum process for Kenyan produced rum? I guess that's the best way for me to say it. Uh, the best way to say it is it's very individual. Across Africa, it's very individual. Well, based on the I Africa, I want to know the one. So like, well, so like right now, there's a company called Bahari Rum, mm-hmm. you know, that, that's from Kenya. It's, uh, they're planning to launch it in the, probably in the next few months. Uh, they did a molasses-based style of a rum. Mm. Uh, if you go down to South, South Africa, they have all these different um, rum scenes, which makes it very interesting. 
so if you wanted to understand rum in Africa in the whole perspective, they have um, around 2025 rum producers across the whole of South Africa. So it's a very interesting scene to see from what an agricultural style of a rum is to what a cachaça style of a rum is. And um, they all have these different intensities from a rum that has a bit of danda to rum that doesn't, that's quite light. And I find it very fascinating because it gives hope to the market. It gives hope to the market that Africa is not as bad as it seems. And Africa is actually producing stuff at a way higher premium level than most markets, despite the fact that it's a very young market as well. So, mm-hmm. oh, it is a very young market. So, it's um, are some of the rums in Africa? Is there any rums that they've exported out of Africa that maybe we could find here in the states to try? Or definitely, any, definitely. Any so, where, where do you say? go? Oh, so there's Moba rum. Let me let, let me just type type this for you. So, there is Moba, which is my favorite. Actually, there is Moba. Um, give me a minute. I'm to type in. Sure. And then there's Agua. Then there's Agua Zulu, which is a South African cachaça style of a rum. Oh. And then, of course, we have the likes of Saint Aubin from Mauritius and um, Takamaka. Those are like the most popular brands from Africa so far. Mm-hmm. But there is also so much more. Like there's a whole entire list. I, mean, I like this, the Agua Zulu, like that one, that one is taking me out right there. So, and I like that, let's see, Mojoba. So these are things I'm actually going to reach out to because I'm always, uh, I think I've heard of Takamaka before. Is it, ta- is it pronounced yeah. Takamaka? Yeah, Takamaka. That one, I, saw, I went to uh, a, Atlanta and there was an African conference we had where they're trying to bring people from, um, the you know people in the black people in the diaspora to Africa to kind of come and look at the resources like you say and see that hey there's more here than you know what you've been told and what you've seen so I definitely want to check that out so tell me um tell me about the your style of, as a bartender do you rely on flair is it more so about crafting the cocktails what's important to you as a bartender when you're doing your your job. Be, I mean, creating bespoke experiences when mm-hmm. I get, cause, cause I get, I get to create stuff using what I have on the farm, the seasonality, the experiences, the spice levels that I'm trying to have around. That is the experience that I always try to to set up because I don't want you to be like, I just did this somewhere else. Can you can you make something like this? I'm like, I don't make something like that. I make better than that because oh. I want you to. Once you're done with me. And, or I'm done with you, you ain't never going to taste this cocktail ever again. It's, I'm done. <laughs> it's out of season. That's it. <laughs> so, Look at you. I, yeah. I see you, man. You got that self-esteem going. All right. I mean, I got to challenge the market. I got to bring something much better than your regular mojito. So given an example, up the farm has uh, six different mints. Mm-hmm. You know, apple, pear mint, uh, black pepper mint, and all that. So when I'm making a mojito, I have to like really think, what is this like the choice of rum that I'm also using? Because different means work w- with different rums differently. Mm-hmm. So but like, your regular bar is just like just put some mint and lime and sugar. I'm like, you cannot do that w- when you have five or six different means because it's like it's not gonna taste the same. You know? Right. So when you were when you were working as a bartender, what type of establishment were you working in? Um, I worked from, you know, all these different uh, types, you know, whether, whether it's a casino, whether it's a club or restaurant. And at some point I got very frustrated because I wasn't getting the experience that I needed or I wanted in the sense that I work a lot with very fresh fruits and very fresh ingredients. So it's very annoying sometimes that though we are trying to standardize the industry, you can never really standardize fruits or, or, or herbs or spices. So it kind of gives you an exposure to also the challenges that are there when it comes to standardization, you know, because if I'm at home and I have French lavender, for example, and 
the bar that I'm working at doesn't have French lavender, what happens? I get to have a better cocktail than what I can get at. So why would I necessarily pay for that? You get where I'm coming from? Mm-hmm. It's like you can have these ingredients and you're be- doing it better in the house. And so it kind of makes you frustrated. And you actually want to be like, I'd rather do it for clients with what I have and what I understand about these different flavors. So, yeah, that happened. And thank God to, to COVID, uh, it actually put me into a place whereby I literally had to play with every different tab and I was like, okay, fine. Maybe there's a reason why it's simple. You know, maybe there's a reason why people just stick to, you know, whatever. <laughs> it's fine. So, uh, so question number one. Is that a rooster that I'm hearing? Yes, that's a rooster. Is that, that, I mean, this guy has chickens in the farm, so we we'll, Wow, gotta, he is back there crooning. He's like, it's time to get up. It's time to get up. You know, it's time to get Okay, so <laughs> I, just had a, I thought I was tripping at first, and I was like, it is. It is morning time where you're at. So once again, thank you so much for being up. Um, you talked about... you your concern with not being able to get the experience that you needed. Cause I felt the same way when I was working at bars, it really was just, let me get a Henny and Coke. Let me get a, a Jack and Coke. It was just a liquor and a spirit. So it's really hard to get that cocktail experience. Cause you're not really challenged. How, how did you challenge yourself? How did you, are you getting that experience so that you can be better? I mean, now with the whole exposure to all these herbs and spices and also that um, I think that exposed me to a lot. So I would literally rip out the recipes and try to um, twist or recreate the same cocktails, whether it's classics or modern cocktails, but using ingredients that I have here, which, mean, which meant that by the time I was presenting a cocktail menu to a client, they at least had the, an, the understanding of what it's all about. You know, if it's a simple gin and tonic, how simple can it be? If I use lemon verbena, or if I use a uh, lavender, you know, f- French lavender syrup and stuff like that. So it kind of gave that experience. And it also built on that level. So even when I met my friends like uh, Brian, who's just joined, I think he's just woken up. Uh, I, I always used to challenge uh, all the young bartenders. You got to think about flavors and, be, be be a chef at, at your bar. Think like a chef. How do chefs think? You know, how do we explore fav- flavors? What does it mean when something is dried and fresh? Is there a big difference? So if you're going to use, let's say, bay leaves, dried bay leaves and fresh bay leaves are two different things. So that kind of whole understanding also makes you want to think about what exactly is in your cocktail. Is it just, as I said, lime sugar and whatever? Or is it is there something else? Creating underlying flavors that makes you experience it not just one way, but rather more than one or two ways. Right. So if I come to if I come to Kenya and yeah. say you were working at a resort, okay, or a bar yeah. or a club, I don't know, wherever you want. Let's say you just work in your bartending. And I come to you and I'm like, make me your best cocktail. What cocktail are you making me? Of course, it has 12 rum, number one. Okay, you're using rum. All right, well, give me a little bit more. Like, give, give me a name. Like, what you're making me. Do you have a, a, a cocktail that you that's just synonymous with you? Or I mean, I love the old fashioned. Regardless, I love the old fashioned because it's the one thing that people screw up. It's just, just like the daiquiri. That actually, the two cocktails are that I genuinely love. The old fashioned and the daiquiri. Never screw my daiquiri up. Okay. Never screw my old fashioned up. If you do, we are having war. It's like civilized war. You know, we ain't gonna play like that. You know. So, so what's what's the secret? <laughs> he said, "We're having war." <laughs> what's the yeah, what's war. the secret to a good like like I'm a first time bartender. Walk me through a good old fashioned. Like, what's a good old fashioned? What's the secret to it? The secret? Yeah. It's the balance. It's a bitters. It's a balance. Don't. I mean, for example, most people, when you're using, when you're starting an old fashioned, yeah, right? You have your brown sugar. You can either use uh, sparkling water or you can use, um, you know, your regular bottled water. I prefer sparkling water for the, for the sugar to just, you know, kind of dissolve as well. 
Mm-hmm. There's a whole lot of that. Um, and as well as um, what bitters you're going to use. Most people use either orange bitters or chocolate bitters. Now, depending on the spirit that you're using and the pairing that you're going to have. So, for example, if you're going to use a rum from Barbados, g- g- let me give an example, Dooley's. If you're going to use a Dooley's 14 or if you're going to use an Appleton 12, then you have to have something that either has orange bitters a bit of orange bitters and a bit of chocolate bitters. Why? Because you have those underlying tones of chocolate or orange in both. So that that has to be there. And of course, you have to use a very, very, very fresh um, orange peel, which is really, really important. Then get that ice cube, that ice cube block. Make sure that the glass is chilled. Make sure that the um, liquid is chilled down to the to the bone, which is really, really important. For, for decorating, Please, the balance is really, really important, man. It's just 30 cl of, you know, lime and sugar, I mean, and 60 cl of rum. That's not hard. Please just don't screw it up. Just, <laughs> I'm not asking you for Greek I do or like science, yeah. you know? Okay. Now for the old brown, brown sugar, old-fashioned? Yeah, brown sugar for the old-fashioned. I have never used that. Does it give it more of like a, and, and for the spirit, are you using a whiskey for your old fashioned or are you using a rum for your old fashioned? I mean, rum. A right. rum old fashioned is good. Okay. I'm taking notes because that's, that's the one reason and I kind of talk to people all the thing is, people do this. What people don't understand. What people don't understand, rum and cigars pair well. So you can actually even make your. Your rum old fashioned is very smoky with a cigar pairing. What I, what I mean is like you can actually light up a cigar and literally um, smoke the glass with the cigar flavors. So, wow, I didn't even think about that. Someone says a because, red I mean, or a Hemingway decorate. Ooh, four or five. That's, yeah. that's good. But now, even if you're going to do a twist on the decorate, remember the balance. Just remember that balance because that balance is important because I or anyone else who has been into the industry, if you've gone into restaurants, there are three drinks that people screw up. The daiquiri, the mojito, and the what else? Let me see. I mean, the daiquiri and the mojito are the most screwed up drinks. And of course, there's the Long Island tea, which is annoying because everyone takes that because you just want to kick the bucket. But please, stop screwing up with the daiquiri. Stop screwing up with the mojito. That's just, it's not fair. (laughs) <laughs> like if you can make a solid decorate, how can I trust you to craft a cocktail? Like it's just all right. Yeah. So we're talking cocktails, and our time, our time. I can't believe how much an hour has already gone by. Like this is just so interesting to me. I have so many questions. Not enough time. Yeah. So many questions. Though. Um, who who is someone in the cocktail industry or bartending industry? that you would love to be able that that you've met and you've just learned a great deal from or you just really i mean it could be a lot of people you know but give me one person i mean there's there's a lot of people you could learn from i mean generally (laughs) across the board um there's some people out there if we're not familiar with bartending who are you following right now that you're like this is a good person this is good with cocktails um okay let, let's just start from your side of the world. Okay. Alex, Luka, who's the Hennessy brand ambassador, she's the she's the brains behind Cousin Star. She's amazing with what she does. She's one of those black sisters that has been impressive for years. I'm just like, God damn, she understands her cognac down to the bro. I'm like, I don't even like cognac, but she made me like Hennessy because mm-hmm. it's just weird. It's just weird. I, I don't like cognac, but she's like, oh, she makes it look good. I'm like, hmm. You know? and <laughs> and like, Alex what? Alex Luger. Okay, Alex Luger. All right, give me one more. Who else? Who else you got? Who else I got? Uh, in Africa, the biggest challenge. Let me see. Let me see. Oh, this. There is a guy you should follow. His name is Theo Boy from Ghana. Oh, nice. Okay. Your boy does flare cocktails. He's um. No, now everybody as a bartender, you can either do flair or you can't. I don't personally understand flair. 
I mean, I respect Flair. I mean, the whole, you know, just wow. And just, like, I watch guys do that. I'm like, I can't because I can risk br- breaking a bottle. Let me just stick to the old fashioned <laughs> look, Nick. Just, we, we, go, we go play safe. <laughs> oh, my yeah. God. I love to watch Flair. I wish I could do Flair. I think if I got to it in my younger years, I per- now nah, I'm lying. I'm not that coordinated. I don't even think I could have did Flair in my younger years. Yeah. I can do stuff like, oh, you know, like basic Flair. <laughs> There is basic flair, and then there is flair that is just um, on another level. So even in Africa, even my, the one who actually got me into the whole decor scene is very good with flair. Very good with flair. I'm like, I see him perform whatever he's doing, and I'm like, wow. Me, on the other hand, I'll stick to, we can talk rum, we can talk gin, we can talk all these things, but don't ask me to shabang like this. I will just, I will stick to lettuce. Not Give me a glass. <laughs> <laughs> Not your bag. Yeah, don't ask him to shebang, you guys. He's, he's don't, just, yeah, don't make him shebang. shebang. You never know what. Yeah, I may drop that thing. You know? <laughs> it would definitely bang. Oh, man. That is so awesome. So who would you want to na- name a person you would want to serve a cocktail to? Like, who's someone that you're like, man, if I would love to serve them one of my top cocktails. Who would you serve? Um, there's a couple of people okay. who I would consider having one uh, on on the what do you call it on the on the dinner table, assuming it was a last supper kind of concept. Uh-huh. But <laughs> I like that last supper cocktails. Who you serving? <laughs> um, Alex, Alex will be on my top list. Alex is okay. really, really, really good. I gotta go find this Alex. Are swooning. Alex is really good. Samara, Samara Davies, who's behind the Black Bourbon Society, really good as well. Okay. You know? And then we have uh, Jay Khan from uh, Singapore, who has a mezcal bar. Really amazing, you know? You got to judge. I mean, those are like, yeah, like, I love mezcal. And he has like an entire mezcal bar in Singapore. Is, I'm like, you know, it just takes things to another level. Um, and of course, my mentor here, who's, uh, his name is King Klein Ojal. He, he told me everything I, I needed to know about cocktails. So I, I pay homage to that guy in particular because he made flair and cocktails seem something very good for me to enjoy. But then I went overboard and became someone else. I became a consultant and, and I'm grateful for that, you know. Um, no, that's what it's supposed to do, the, right? You, to yeah, this is supposed to pass the master, you know. Um, of course, there is you. Yeah. I mean, every, every every time you have a, when you're working with your friends, you gotta have your people. You gotta have your, bring them to the table, you know. Mm-hmm. And there's so many, so many more. I mean, there's Lynette Marrero, who is also one of the my big sisters. I talk to her almost about everything. There's um. Jennifer Akin from the Ramba Seattle, the mm-hmm. former general manager for the Ramba. So, yeah, I mean. Oh, I said the dead rabbit. Check out the dead rabbit. Yeah. Park. Nice. Dead rabbit is really good. I don't know if they're back because there was a time they they shut down, but I'm hoping they're back. Ooh. I hope their Instagram was up because that's the cool thing about putting things on your Instagram. Because even if business does sh- shut down, you can still go back and kind of look at um, look at what people have done and kind of get that inspiration, that education from that. Now, y- y'all need to visit. Okay, I-, I-, I forgot to mention this. Okay. I don't know if y'all know this. There is a gene in Africa made from elephant poop. I heard of that. I heard of that. And you know, we were like, not some white people stuff. But wait, <laughs> have you had the elephant poop gin? Yeah, really good. What? What? So, so, how does that happen? What makes someone say, you know, what we should make alcohol out of? Shit. Like, what? Well, let me tell you, people. Human humanity is crazy because this was a guy who just went and to a national park. He saw like elephants just. 
put in a, you know, on the ground. And he's like, wait a minute. All these elephants have one thing in common. They eat a lot. Yeah. But they don't digest completely everything, right? So he took this poo, collected it, did a bit of sample testing and all that, then dried it out and realized a lot of the nutrients, a lot of the ingredients that we use in gene that elephants take naturally remains on the poop. So he dried it out and actually started making the gene out of it. Now, in as much as it sounds disgusting, it's the same thing as the Java coffee, whereby there's this monkey that does eat the coffee beans and then (laughs) there's less acidity. So let me tell you, it is really good. And I think people should stop thinking about um, spirits from a very, like, let's just be honest, it, it tastes good. It tastes really good. I will keep an open mind if I come to Africa. Okay, I'm gonna do as the Africans do, and I mean, I might try some shitty gin. <laughs> I, I, I might mean, have to try this. I, I will. I I tell I tell my friends that you do not know what you're taking until someone tells you. It's like the same thing with food. Like if I didn't tell you about what I'd prepared and you ate and you enjoyed the food. Then why are you getting shocked when I tell you what it is? Don't you have this like body reaction that, for example, this might be really disgusting, but what if it's really good? You know? So that's the same concept with the gene that he had. No one will ever have thought that actually you can make gene from poop. Yeah, I mean, I, I get it. I guess it's the, the morality of, you know, this person is normally eat poop i feel like it's my duty to kind of let them know what they're doing but to be like hey just keep an open mind and, and just kind of like leave it up to leave it up to them like don't trick me into drinking poop i'm gonna come over there i'm going to drink the shitty gin i'm going to try it out because i'm interested in it. so don't trick me into doing it because then i'll never trust you again but then like he's so he's um he's so open about it like this good elephants really, you know like these elephants are not taking like any chemical stuff they're literally just eating from the plants you know and they're just taking that and they're drying it out and they're making the spirit out of it so yeah Oof, africa y'all some wild boys out there <laughs> wild. <laughs> we got some wild stuff <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me today. Go ahead, promote yourself. What do you have going on? What do you want people to buy? What do you want people to, to check out? You got one minute. Promote yourself. Go ahead. Uh, hey, so thanks for y'all being here i mean eugene is the ram bishop in africa i also have a farm that i'm working on the i said the farm project and so if you all want to know more about fruit farming organic farming farm to glass cocktails just reach out i mean if you would trying to start out from a farm perspective to how to actually do sustainability around stuff that you can grow i'm here please feel free to ask and please feel free to reach out and know how to de- develop puries or beaters from your home, home stand or home bar or your restaurant spaces. Yep. Excellent. Thank you so much. Do you mind if I post this video up on my YouTube and on Instagram so people can see it for, for years and years to come? Please feel free to post and share and tweet or DM. Yeah, yeah, I'll just And when you're ready to visit Africa, Welcome. I mean, it's the land of the Lion King, right? Hakuna Matata. Ah, means no worries. <laughs> yeah, no worries. <laughs> thank you so much for joining me today. You guys, thank you for checking me out. Check out the Rum Bishop. Follow him on Instagram. Check me out, Miss Champagne B. Follow me on Instagram. Check out my YouTube channel, Diary of a Mad Black Bartender, where you can catch the replay on here and the replay on the Instagram too. Thank you so much for joining me. Bye. Bye.